All right, title of the sermon this morning is Love Not the World. Love Not the World. I'm going to be preaching on the topic of worldliness. Worldliness. So, you know, sometimes you'll, you know, we, we talk about, okay, we want to walk in the ways of the God, in God. We don't want to walk in the ways of the world. Or you may say like, well, that's worldly. This Christian is being worldly or this person is worldly. Or you say, don't do that. It's worldly. What do we mean by that? What, what is worldliness? Well, the Bible defines worldliness. But let me just first of all say what worldliness is not, right? So worldliness is not just things that are new, right? So some people think worldliness is, oh, you know, you preach against worldliness. You say all these things against worldliness, but look, you, you use the internet, you use a computer. Oh, you know, are these things... Well, well, things are not worldly just because they are new, such as technology. Also, things are not worldly just because they are a tradition that is not necessarily in the Bible. There are many traditions that are not sinful. So, for example, celebrating an anniversary, celebrating a birthday, you know, celebrating Christmas and Easter. And we're, we're not going into the topics of all the debates about those. But when you celebrate these traditions or you have traditions in your family, that's not worldly just because, just because it's not necessarily something specifically outlined in the Bible. That doesn't mean we don't have the liberty to live and have, have different ways and different traditions of our own. They're not necessarily sinful. So that doesn't make things worldly either, just because they're not in the Bible. And things aren't worldly. Uh, and worldliness is not purely just entertainment, right? Sometimes you have Christians, you know, they just think anything that is fun is like worldly and like Christians just aren't allowed to have fun you know you're not allowed to listen to music you're not allowed to to dance you're not allowed to you know watch a movie you're not allowed to have leisure you know you're not allowed to play sports you know some people are passionate about sports right and sports is a good thing it gets you healthy it gets you entertained we just don't want these things to be prioritized above God but is it worldly? You know, is it like you just label everything as fun? It's like, is it just worldly? That's sometimes how fundamental Christians go too far the other way. And they just say, well, they just call everything worldly. No, worldly has a definition in the Bible. And this is what it means to be worldly. So we're going to talk about worldliness today. This is why we read from 1 John 2. <coughs> the Bible says here, 1 John 2, says, Love not the world neither the things that, that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So you see, it's not just things that are worldly that are just things in the world. It then goes on to define what it means by worldly. For all that is in the world, and we have three categories here that are given. I'm going to talk about each of these three categories today. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So notice how what is worldliness characterized by? It's characterized by lust, right? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and even pride really is a sense of lust too, right? Because you're desiring to lift yourself up higher than you ought. Maybe you're putting yourself above God even. And then it says here in verse 17, and the world passes away, look, and the lust thereof. So this is what worldliness is characterized by. It's characterized by lust. And notice it says here, if any man love the world, the love, in verse 16, the love of the Father is not in him. So, you see how the love of the world and the love of the Father, there is a indirect, they're indirectly proportional. You know, take you back to your maths days. It was a long time ago for me. You go back to your high school maths. You learn directly proportional. It's like when things, as they grow, they grow together. But the love of the world and the love of the Father, the love of God, they are indirectly proportional. What does that mean? The more you love the world, the less you love God. Right? The more you love God, the less you're going to love the world. And like I said, not the misunderstanding of what worldliness is. It's what's defined here, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. So inversely, we could say it, you know, the more you love 
the world, you can see for yourself, that's how much you love God. That's revealing how much you love God. And likewise, vice versa, right? Now, what's one thing that's interesting, when we go back in the Bible, to the very beginning, to the very first sin of woman, right? Now, woman sinned before man, but man was over in dominion over the, of the earth, right? So this is why the, 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 um, the world fell, I guess the world, world went into sin because of man. But Eve actually sinned first, right? She, she took and ate of the tree first. But you can see the same lust that tempted Eve to take of the fruit of the tree are the same lusts of the world that are described in 1 John 2. Look at Genesis 3, 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. See that? That's the lust of the eyes. You know, it was pleasant to the eyes. And a tree to desired to make one wise. So, sorry, it says here that the tree was good for food. That's the lust of the flesh. And that it was pleasant to the eyes. The lust of the eyes. And a tree desired to make one wise. Why is that the pride of life? Because remember, Satan said to her, well, no, because God's keeping things from you, right? So this idea that they know better than God, we're going to eat this fruit so that we can know this thing that God is keeping from us. So that's this pride of life. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. So that's a bit about one. Now let's get into each of these three things that, that 1 John 2 tells us, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. <coughs> The first one we're going to talk about is the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. Now, when we think of the lust of the flesh, some, some obvious ones come to mind, right? You got drugs, substance abuse, drunkenness, gluttony. Now, really, even though you know, we say drugs is like a separate category, because we're talking about people just using that specific substance, you really can be, it can really be in the category of food, right? So the Bible doesn't really talk about drugs per se. The Bible talks about being a glutton and being a drunken, because really either you're drinking something or you're eating something, you're consuming something. And even drugs, you know, they, they tend to come from natural substances, right? It's just that they're used in quantities that are not right and, they, and they, you're no longer sober. So this is why people, um, I, I think I've got this right, you know, they'll eat like an orange and poppy seed muffin or something, and then they might test positive for heroin, right? Because it's like the same substance is in it. But what's the problem when we're talking about drugs? They're, they're, they're abusing that substance, right? And then they're no longer sober. It's, it's messing with their mind, which is the same with drunkenness and gluttony. Uh, so you've got excessive alcohol, excessive food. And then we have fornication, which is sexual acts outside of marriage. These are the things that we think about when we think about the lusts of the flesh. It's things that we desire. Uh, in our flesh. Now, one thing about the lusts of the flesh, that these things are not inherently sinful. Right? These are not inherently sinful. So think about consuming liquids, consuming foods, right? There's nothing wrong with consuming a substance. There's nothing wrong with drinking a substance, right? And there's nothing inherently sinful about sex. Right? Which is born case. So where does where when does it make it wrong? Right? Where it is wrong is when it is practiced outside the, the moral boundaries. Right? So when it comes to food and drink, it's the excess of these things. And that's why when it's same with drugs, like you know, is it is it sinful then to eat a poppy seed muffin? No, but you're consuming the same stuff. When what is wrong? What's the lust of the flesh? It's when you're taking out that chemical and you know, putting it in higher volumes and injecting it into your bloodstream and getting the high, becoming addicted to it. That's the problem, right? So it's the same. Food, you know, people, you know, and Christians, you know, they'll talk about smoking and cocaine and heroin and all these things all day long. But yet they don't talk about their own addictions of like sugar and caffeine and all these sorts of things. That, and they, you know, and they don't have their coffee in the morning and they're just all their joy is gone. They're terrible they're in the flesh and everything. And how do you think a drug addict is like? Right? It's the same thing. So it's the same when people, they, they, maybe they, they get addicted to sugar and they're just like drinking soft drink all the time and they're overweight and things like that. So 
Sometimes Christians, you know, they can focus on the sins that they're not doing, but then they don't think about how the lusts of the flesh actually impact them as well. And like I said, there's nothing wrong with the sexual act, but when is it wrong? It's when it's outside of marriage, you know, so outside of marriage, whether that's, you know, just what we consider fornication or homosexuality, bestiality, all sorts of other things, you know, multiple wives and all that, because it's outside the bounds of marriage, which is one man and one woman for life. So let's look at some verses here where we see it's, it's not, so they're not sinful in and of themselves. And this is where you need to understand this point because you don't want to take a stand on things and be not sound in your position, right? Where people just think, well, hey, this thing is sinful, that thing is sinful, where they just think it's the mere consumption of it. No, it's the excess consumption of it. And I remember even having conversations when I was a younger Christian, because I, you know, when you're a younger Christian and you're trying to be black and white, and there's no nuance in your positions, you know, you're saying, oh, it's a sin, telling your friends, hey, it's a sin to smoke. But I remember, I remember having the argument with them. They're like, well, you know, people can abuse sugar. You, you need sugar. So they, they say, well, if I have one cigarette, what does the matter? You know, you have a soda, same thing. Yeah, that's, a, that's a fair point, right? So this is why it's, it's the abuse of these substances, right? It's the addiction. That's the problem. It's the excess. Of it. Now, nobody's really saying where that line is, right? So, you know, the Bible gives us principles, and we're trying to stay as far away as that line as possible. So nobody's saying we know exactly, you know, the milligrams of how much you're allowed to consume until you go over that line. But the idea is there is such thing as an excess, and we don't want to go near that. We want to try and stay away from that. Ephesians 5.17, this is on alcohol. So I don't believe consuming a little bit of alcohol is sinful. What is sinful? Drunkenness. See, it's the excess consumption of alcohol. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Proverbs 23, this is a proverb on, like I said, the Bible really just talks about the food and the drink. Hear thou, my son, and be wise and guide thine heart in the way. Be not among wine-bibbers and among riotous eaters of flesh. So this is referring to the two, the drunkenness and the gluttony, right? For the drunkard and the glutton shall come to poverty and drowsiness <coughs> shall clothe a man with rags. So not only is it warning us against drunkenness and gluttony, but it's also warning us against the sort of company we keep, right? So you don't want to be worldly yourself, but you don't also want to be around worldly people because they also will impact, you know, infect you and influence you to start being worldly. This is why the Bible says, be not among wine bibbers and among riotous eaters of flesh. And sometimes those of us who were not Christians before, we grew up with a lot of worldly people. Then we get saved and we keep hanging around these worldly people and we wonder why it's so hard for us to stop being worldly. It's because we're not you know, we keep being among these wine bibbers and riotous eaters of flesh all the time, and they're the, just our main circle of influence, and they're influencing us. You know, they're influencing, they're making it harder to give up those things. It's no different to a smoker. Like a smoker is trying to give up smoking, but if they're hanging around smokers all the time, I mean, how much more difficult are they making it for themselves to walk in the spirit and to not be worldly when the people they're hanging around are worldly. Now, I'm not saying that you just cut them off completely. You know, you want to be able to influence them, but you need to be aware that it's a lot easier to be pulled down than it is to be pulled up. And you need to take heed unto yourself to make sure you're not pulled back because when you want to be able to influence them, but the tendency of sin and gravity, you know, the gravity of sin is pulling you back, likely it's going to go the other way. So you see the drunken and the glutton, the food and the drink. Look at what it says here in Deuteronomy 21. Notice here the, uh, the, dis the disobedient uh, child in Deuteronomy 21. And this is not talking about babies and infants and very young children. It says here in verse 18, If a man have a stubborn and rebellious son, which will not obey the voice of his father or the voice of his mother, and that when they have chastened him will not hearken unto them, then shall his father and his mother lay hold on him, and bring him out unto the elders of his city and unto the gates of this place. And they shall say unto the elders of his city, This our son is stubborn 
and rebellious. He will not obey our voice. He is a glutton and a drunkard. And all the men of his city shall stone him with stones that he die. So shalt thou put evil away from among you. And all Israel shall hear and fear. So like we talked about last week, you know, honoring your parents, you know, God takes you know, respect in society very seriously, where, you know, even disobedient children, we're not talking about young children, right? You can see here the, you know, we're not, we're not talking about, you know, young children that don't really know what they're doing, there's just the natural rebelliousness of, of children. We're talking about an older, you know, maybe a teenager even, or a young adult who is rebellious and stubborn. You can see he's a drunkard and he's a glutton. And, you know, this is, this is the penalty. For them if they continue in that rebellion and they can bring them before the judges and, and make an example of them notice there the drunkenness and the gluttony it's not just the consumption of it it's the excess now first corinthians 7 is talking about fornication all right so there's nothing wrong with sex sex in and of itself is not worldly so it's not like you know as i understand sometimes the catholic view of sex is it's just dirty in and of itself no, there's nothing wrong with sex. Sex existed prior to the fall of man, right? Sex was something God created. It's something that's beautiful between a husband and a wife. But that's where it belongs. That's where it's beautiful. Other, when it's outside of marriage, that's when it becomes sin. That's when it's a lust of the flesh. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 6. This is the last passage I'll look at in Lust of the Flesh. <clears throat> we all know that, you know, our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. It doesn't belong to us. But if you read the context of 1 Corinthians 6, it really is about, what is it? Food, drink, right? These lusts of the flesh and fornication. That's why there's lust of the flesh. There's not really that many. If you think, if you think about it really, there's not really that many categories of sins people are struggling with really the same sorts of stuff and you know obviously with substance abuse whether it's food or drugs or alcohol or fornication right which is you know having sex outside of marriage first corinthians 6 says here all things are lawful unto me but all things are not expedient all things are lawful for me but i will not be brought under the power of any so you see there that that is what i was referring to before that things aren't sinful necessarily in and of themselves like a substance right is it is it all right to consume that substance yes but what is he saying here but is it is it a good thing is it expedient does it help you does it help others to do this thing so wisdom is about should you do it not whether or not it's are you allowed to do it right so you you can be allowed to do a lot of things in the christian life you have, you have that liberty it's lawful but should you do it is the question that is being asked here is it not all things are expedient all things are lawful for me but i will not be brought under the power of any you know that's another way you can say that but i'm not going to be addicted to any of these things you know i'm not going to let these things control me meats for the belly and belly for the meat so you see here that's talking about food but god shall destroy both it and them <coughs> now he talks about fornication now the body is not for fornication but for the lord and the lord for the body so you see there the two categories of like consumption and sex god hath both raised up the lord and will also raise up us by his own power know ye not that your bodies are the members of christ shall i then take the members of christ and make them the members of an harlot god forbid so this is why, you know, you try and tell people, drop, you know, don't take drugs and whatnot. And then people say, oh, is it a sin? Well, the question is not, is it lawful? Is it expedient? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Are you going to take the members of Christ and make them the members of the heart? Are you going to fornicate with your body? Are you going to trash your body with drugs and substance abuse? No, because it doesn't belong to you. This is what's being taught here in 1 Corinthians 6. And make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. So that's what he's saying. When you fornicate, you are taking the member of Christ, the temple of Christ, and joining it to a harlot. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. 
Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. And now the verses that most people know, they talk about drop, but now you know in the context, it is really referring to that type of thing. The lust of the flesh, of the substance abuse, and fornication. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own. For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. All right, let's go on. So that's the lusts of the flesh. Drugs, drunkenness, <coughs> gluttony, fornication. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Let's go on to the next one. The lusts of the eyes. I've got three to talk about in particular. Lusts of the eyes. Now, first thing we probably think about, we think about the lusts of the eyes. Well, I don't know what's the first thing you think about. Well, this is the order I have them. The first one is covetousness covetousness right the lust of the eye just desiring riches material possession making that an end in and of itself so there's nothing wrong in trying to excel in life earning riches in order to help other people it's just is desiring riches an end in and of itself are you like the rich fool like we read in uh, luke 12 what he says here he says unto them he said unto them is jesus take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. What's he saying? Your life is not just about the things you own. Right? But some people live that way. They live a life like all that matters, and their value is derived by how much material wealth they have. And you know, that can manifest itself in men. But it also manifests itself in women. Why? When women say, oh, I'm just a housewife. Oh, I'm just a mom. And, and they think the value ascribed to you is how much you earn and how much net worth you have. And Jesus is saying, hey, beware of covetousness. A man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. Your life's value is not determined by the net worth of the material things that you own. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself. So this guy's doing well. Right? He's, 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 not, he's not poor. I mean, he's well off. His business is booming. His ground brings forth plenty. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. So this idea that this person was not content with even being successful already. I mean, and sometimes that happens in this world. People are already successful, they're already doing very well, and instead of then now using their riches and their abundance of time to serve God, to serve other people, which is really why God is blessing them with these riches. No, they use that to serve themselves, right? And, he's, and his idea is, no, I've, well, now, instead of using my abundance to then help others, I'm just going to pull down my barns, and as you spend money pulling down the existing barns to build greater barns so they can just store more for himself. This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Now this I see is like the mindset of like retire, retirement, right? So the way, the way we should really think in the Christian life is, yes, it's good to make money, right? It's good to get that time back. But then when you retire, are you retiring just to live like a hedonistic lifestyle where all it is is about travel and about serving yourself and just all the hedonistic pleasures that you didn't have time to do later? You just like spend the rest, you know, of the rest, last 20 years of your life or whatever, just like living it up? No, right? So we still need to be serving God. We still need to be serving others. So this is what's happening here. The rich fool now built up all his wealth, and now it's just all about him. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And it's unfortunate, you know. So for those of us, when we when we're older, we should still maintain that example to the next generations to say, hey, like Paul, we finished our course with joy. 
So you don't want to get to that point where you're just saying, oh, in back in the day, back in the day, I did this, I did that. Hey, why don't you serve God faithfully all the way up until the end of your life? And really your retirement years where, you know, you have this wealth and you have this time, really you should be, you should be serving God even more, right? Because now you have the, the time to spare. You don't have the kids to raise. You don't have to be maybe working nine to five. You're now able to maybe mentor, do ministries to help other people to grow as a more elderly person in church. That's the mindset we should have as Christians, not just, well, we then take a break and then now life is all about us. But God said unto him, thou fool, thou fool. So see, this mindset of the rich fool exists amongst us as well. And you need to see here that God is saying, hey, this is a foolish attitude to have, just to live for things be covetous build up wealth for yourself just self-serving this night thy soul shall be required of thee <coughs> then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward god so we want to be aware of covetousness that's you know, the lust of the eyes desiring riches as an end now then you have envy Envy is like a lust of the eyes. So this is different to jealousy. You know, jealousy in the Bible is not actually a negative thing. We, we use the term jealous as a colloquial, but really what we mean by it is envy. It's when you desire something that belongs to somebody else. So when the Bible talks about jealousy, it's actually being possessive over something that is actually yours. This is why God is a jealous God. He doesn't want us worshipping other gods because he is due that worship. So there's nothing wrong with him expecting the worship due to him just like there's nothing wrong of a husband and a wife right expecting their spouse to be mutually exclusive right so that's the jealousy that a husband and wife should feel and it's and that's right and that's righteous but envy is when you desire something that belongs to somebody else now this is what the tenth commandment is right to not covet things that belong to other people Proverbs, uh, Exodus 20, 17. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. So you see there's belongings and then there's people too. Nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. <coughs> now the way Deuteronomy phrases this, if you want to know what covetousness is, look at this. Neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife. See, so it's the lust of the eyes, right? The desiring something that doesn't belong to you. Neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. Now, this is obviously an issue of the heart, right? Because you can you know, say, hey, that's great, you know, what people have and be happy for them. The question is, are you envious of it? Do you think... You desire the things that they have because they're not yours. That's what it's referring to when it's talking about covetousness and envy and, and the, the Tenth Commandment. Now, what else is in the lust of the eyes? So we, it's alluded to here in the Tenth Commandment. You have things that people desire, lust of the eyes, but then there are also people, right? So one other thing people will talk about when they think about the lust of the eyes, the obvious one, is pornography, right? Pornography. Lusting after people in a sexual way is a sin as well. Some people have the mindset, and it's a, it's a worldly mindset, right? Now we talk about worldliness. Worldly mindset is, it's okay to look, but don't touch. Is that what the Bible teaches? Is that what God says? It's okay for, you know, man to just look at all the stuff on social media and go here and just like pervert on all the girls and say, hey, well, uh, uh, look, but don't touch. Hey, you know, you can preheat the oven here, but as long as you eat at home, or you know what they say, build up your appetite here, but as long as you eat at home, it's okay. Is that a godly attitude? Is that right? Is that what God expects? No, right? It's about what's in the mind as well and what the lust of the eyes is. Look at what the Bible says in Matthew 5, 27. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. Right? So that's the actual act. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. 
So you see how even the lust of the eyes, the looking, and I'm, you know, I'm talking about men because men are probably the main culprit, but women as well. You know, we're, it's, not, it's not that pornography is just a male problem. Pornography is also a female problem too. It's just more stereotypically it's men in probably proportion wise. But women also struggle with this sin as well. Well, my point here is that, hey, that is a sin too. Now, it's not the equivalent. So this is where sometimes people misunderstand. You know, looking with lust, no, it's not the equivalent of committing adultery, but it is committing adultery in your heart. Right? It, is still a, it is still a sin. It's something that we should not indulge in and we definitely should never have the attitude of it's okay to look, but don't touch because, no, both are wrong, right? To look, to look and to lust is also wrong as well as to act on it. Now, sex is just like a drug, if you think about it. And you have to take care of it like, a, like, like you've got to be aware of drugs as well. Because sex creates a high that is addictive, just like drugs do, right? And if it's not used within God's boundaries, it can destroy a person. So think about when you think of the... Um, the drug addict and you think you know that person can't get motivated that person's like addicted and everything they do is about obtaining that that's pornography is the same it has the same dangers right because like i said sex and the sexual gratification is just as addictive and just as dangerous as just like a drug and this is why you see you know a man's sexual drive and i'm talking about men because it, it, it impacts men more so than women but you think about a man's sexual drive ought to encourage him to excel, right? It ought to encourage him to, to mature and commit to the one woman, right? Think about when a, when a man is dating a woman, right? They say, like, you know, women probably say, you know, when you were dating me, you moved mountains, right? And why is it? Because that's a powerful force, right? The sexual drive of a man, that he's willing to, like, move mountains. It's, a, it's, a, it's one of the encouragements that actually God is using to make us a man. But then when you gratify that sexual desire outside of marriage, you just, it starts to destroy me, right? Because it's like a man that's not working. It doesn't feel like a man anymore. You know, you're like watching pornography and satisfying yourself. You, you start, that's why now men, you know, because pornography is just so available to everyone, right? It's just so easy to obtain that it is destroying men. And instead of that drive encouraging men to get married, to be a man, to, you know, and, and to, to start doing it the way God intended, right? Pornography can turn a man into a recluse and make them depressed. And now you have, you know, for those of you who know, people that struggle with pornography and masturbation and whatnot, now they have like help groups where they're trying to get men out of that addiction because it's like a drug addiction. That's why don't, you know, like, uh, who, who is it? Is it Steve Irwin? Don't muck with it. <laughs> don't muck with it because it's, it's very dangerous right you want to use that that desire to actually excel in life not to just gratify it and destroy your own life just like drugs do let's look at proverbs 7 proverbs 7 is the last verse i'll talk about in this lust of the flesh proverbs 7 i won't read the whole proverb but two parts of it is warning about the strange woman the strange woman and you hear about the strange woman in proverbs and there's nothing new under the sun but you know unfortunately with technology and social media the strange woman is now not just on the street corner now she's in the palm of your hand anywhere accessible 24 7. for at the window of my house i looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding. And sometimes I think it's so, it's, it's so unfortunate, right? Because a lot of young men get caught up in pornography. And I just think it, it, it just, like, just like a person getting caught up in drugs, it just stunts their potential. So you just feel like this young man could have been so much more, but if they, you know, started going into this, it, it, it stunted their growth as a, as a person. I beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths of a young man, void of understanding passing through the street near her corner and he went the way to her house in the twilight in the evening in the black and dark night and behold there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart she is loud and stubborn her feet abide not in her house 
right? So she's not seeking to be a godly mother housewife. She is now, she is without, now in the streets and lieth in wait at every corner. And like I said, in the past, right, you had to go find the strange woman, right? In the streets, out. Now with social media, men don't need to go out, right? They can look at it in the, in the, in the comfort of their own home, in the recluse of their room, right? In the private, nobody knows. And all the filth that you can imagine is accessible just by a click. But be aware of it. This is what Proverbs 7 is warning us of. You know, this, we gotta, be, we gotta take care of this. This is why, you know, those of us who have young men, you know, you know, I don't let my children use their devices like just in the privacy of the room. They can't lock their doors. They're not having a computer with the internet in their room. Nobody knows what's going on because I'm not a fool. You know, I've been a young man before. I know what the temptations are. And now, you know, you can't do anything without being tempted now. Because at least before it was harder to find. But now it's just like banners just everywhere. You know, it's on you, everything. You just can't. So, hey, how can you stop that? Well, accountability. Just make sure you're not in private. So, you know, you're not just going about on the streets, unaccountable, you know, where they're lying at weight at every corner. But now, like I said, you've got to be take care with the, with the social media. Proverbs 7.21 <coughs> With her much fair speech she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasteth to the snare and knoweth not that is for his life. You see, it's just like I said, it's just like drugs. They dabble in it, they start getting into the social media, they're watching all the porn, and they're signing up for all the porn sites and everything like that, and they don't even realise that their life is being destroyed just like drugs is destroying their life. Hearken unto me now therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways, Go not astray in her paths, for she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. And that whole proverb is about that. This is a stark warning against the strange woman. Like I said, the strange woman is now not on every street corner, it's on social media everywhere, right? And we know what they look like. Right? Because you see the short videos, you know, somebody's just scrolling through it and it's just all plastered all over, right? Now, women, don't be like the strange woman. We know what the strange woman is like, right? Flaring of the lips, wanting people to look at her body, using her body to get attention, you know, they do the content creation, but ah, oh, and they just like, you know, there, ah, oh, now I get a few more likes, you know, you know, taking the photos on social media, wanting the likes. Don't be the strange woman. You know, as a believer, as a, as a daughter of God, you know, there's a struggle that men have. It's a danger. Women on the other side, don't be like the strange woman, right? So what are we talking about? Lusts of the eyes. Pornography. Beware. Last one. Let's talk about <coughs> the pride of life. Pride of life. That's the last one. Now, what is the pride of life? You've got a few different types, examples here. One is arrogancy. Arrogancy. Romans 12, 3, look at what it says here. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. So, arrogancy is when people, you know, have are prideful, you know, the pride of life. They think of themselves higher than they ought. You know, people don't think they're a sinner. People think they can't do anything wrong. No, we are sinners saved by grace in the eyes of God. And without Jesus Christ, we can do nothing. Do we have that mindset? Or do we think we do everything? That's the pride of life when we lift up ourselves higher than we ought. The fear of the Lord, Proverbs 8, 13, is to hate evil, look, pride and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. So see, it's not only in the behavior, but it's in the way people speak. Do they have a prideful mouth? Proverbs 6.16 These six things doth the Lord hate, 
yea, seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look, that's the first one. A lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among <coughs> the brethren. See, the first one there, a proud look. I'm talking about worldliness today, we're talking about lust. Think about the people of the world. And the, what is better representative of the people of the world but the Hollywood superstars, the movie stars, things like that. What is their look? You know, all the jewellery, trying on all their wealth, you know, all the album covers. You know, either the album cover is like, you know, them trying to look cool or it's just like a woman with no clothes. That's just like, because that's worldliness, right? What is it? It's either the lust of the flesh or the, it's the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. This is what they get people with because this is what the sinful flesh desires. Now, what about the pride of life? Nothing, you know, is there anything more representative of the pride of life than the homosexual agenda? You know, that's like, that's like both in one. Where it's like not only are they, you know, the, the proud look and the arrogancy, the froward mouth, but then they just want to put their filth on display for everyone to see. They march down the streets in their little thongs and all, and all this filth. And not only do they commit fornication, homosexual, all sorts of acts, they want to put it on display for everyone to see. They're, pr pr they're proud of it. What do they call the homosexual agenda? Gay pride. You see? So this is what the Bible is talking about too. Look at what it says here about Sodom. We know why Sodom was destroyed. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride. Fullness of bread. Right? So let's think about the lust of the flesh. Right? Lust of the flesh. Pride and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. They were haughty committed abomination before me. Therefore I took them away as I saw good. So we can see, we know what the pride of life is. This is the things that we don't want to emulate. You know, that we don't want to be influenced by. So not only is it arrogancy, pride. What about pride of life? Self-praise. You know, self-praise. Talking about how good we are. You know, talking ourselves up. Things like that. Proverbs 27.1 Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth, a stranger, and not thine own lips. Right? So hey, we shouldn't be just talking about how great we are. That's, what, that's the job of others, to praise a person, not praising, not self-praise. <coughs> Proverbs 26, most men... So this is standard. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. But a faithful man, who can fight? So not only is the pride of life about arrogancy, self-praise, but it's also the desire for power and wealth. right? Because we want to lift up ourselves. So people desire power and wealth. Why? Because they, they want to be served rather than served. Look what Jesus says in Mark 10, 42. But Jesus called them to him and said unto them, Ye know that they which are accounted to rule over the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and their great ones exercise authority upon them. So he's saying, so in the world, people are trying to be served. They're trying to be the boss and have everyone serve them. But he says here, but so shall it not be <coughs> among you. But whosoever will be great among you shall be your minister. What is a minister? A minister is somebody that serves, right? So when he says, hey, it's not, that's not what it should be like among you. You shouldn't be like the world with the pride of life, desiring just that everybody serves you. And this life is about amassing power and wealth so that you can be served like the dictators of this world. Your goal is to be a minister. Your goal is to serve. And whosoever of you will be chiefest shall be servant of all. I preached a sermon once. I was serving your way to greatness. So you want to be great in the eyes of God? You serve. For even the Son of Man, you, you know, even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life 
a ransom for many. Is that not one of the main attributes of Jesus Christ? We want to be more like Jesus? Is we serve, right? Like Jesus served. He gave his life for many. He didn't come here to be served. He came here to give his life and to be a minister and a ransom. So not only the desire to be served, have the power, but the greed as well. How does greed line up with the pride of life? Well, because who, who do you serve? Do you serve God? Or have you become your own God, right? And you're serving yourself. That's why covetousness is called idolatry, right? So pride is about lifting yourself up higher than you ought. And if you live your life just about laying up treasures on earth, it's all about serving you. Excuse me, what is your life meant to be about? It's about serving God. So you see how this ties in with the pride of life. If our life, and we just think, it's also all about building up wealth for ourselves, like the rich fool. Look at what Jesus says here in Matthew 6, 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? So you can see here that the layup for your child's treasures in heaven is tied in here with Matthew 6, 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Isn't that consistent with love not the world, neither the things that are in the world? If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You see how these are two that are indirectly proportional to one another? And that's why it all, all ties together. So we ought not to live for ourselves. We ought to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why greed ties into the pride of life. Last verse in, in this section, 2 Corinthians 5, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Right? So he's saying because Jesus died for us, we ought not to live for ourselves. We ought to live for the Lord Jesus Christ. So you have the lust of the flesh, drugs, drunkenness, gluttony, fornication. The lust of the eyes, covetousness, envy, pornography, the pride of life, arrogancy, self-praise, power, greed. Now some questions on reflection. Are you worldly? This is what you should ask yourself. The question: How worldly are you? So now, when you think about, when you say, when something is worldly, what does that mean? Is your appearance worldly? Is it characterized by lust? Is your speech worldly? What does that mean? The pride of life, the froward mouth, the self-praise. Is your industry worldly? See, some industries Christians should stray away from because it's like, is it a worldly industry? You know, you don't necessarily want to be an industry promoting worldliness. Are your friends worldly? Is your music worldly? Are your movies worldly? What do they mean by worldly? Do they glorify and promote worldliness? And we talked about what worldliness is. So, this is like I said, it's indirectly proportional to and how much do you love God? Right, so that, that's how you reflect on it. The worldliness versus your love for God because these are indirectly proportional. 1 John 2, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. So I like 
the different parts of this verse. Because the first verse tells us that these things are indirectly proportional. And we have to be aware, because as we grow in one, we're, we're going to be diminishing in the other. Right? The love of the world and the love of God. Then it tells us, this is what worldliness is. These are the things that we have to be aware of. And then verse 17, it's almost like saying, these things aren't worth it. Because they're temporary. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And we know from experience that that is the truth. That we dabble in worldliness, you know, and we, we, you know, been all of us, including myself, been worldly at times. But it's a good reminder today that it's not worth it, you know. And all those things will be temporary. All those things will be done away. But the things you do for God, the love you have for God, will abide eternally, and you'll be rewarded for eternally. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the reminder this morning not to be worldly. Now we learned what worldliness is. Lord, help us so hard to fight against the sinful flesh. So we ask for your grace, Lord. We ask for your mercy. Help us to live lives pleasing to you. Help us to be renewed in our mind. Help us to be that reasonable, that sacrifice, re that do that reasonable service. Don't let us be conformed to this world. So we ask you to help us, Lord. Use us for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.